Alrighty, rock and roll. Thank you very much for the intro, Jim. Today we're going to go over, like Jim said, the uh, evaluate. It's the whole reason why we assemble. We're just going to be taking a uh, quick little, you know, view at the evaluate toolbar at the assembly level and uh, why, how, and what we can use it. In 2009, renowned leadership expert Simon Sinek gave one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time where he explained how companies and leaders achieve success and defy the odds with a simple method that he calls uh, the golden circle. Very famous TED Talk. According to Sinek, average companies and average people go from what to how to why, and very few even get to that center there, the why. But the truly great and extraordinary start with why, which leads them to how, and finally to their what. So this is a perfect model for explaining the evaluate toolbar tools at the assembly level. Because whenever somebody asks me what the tool does, I give them a very simple answer, nothing. The tool doesn't do anything. But instead, if we ask, why we should use these tools. We're going to find out that they can, uh, you know, provide everything for us that we need at the assembly level. So let's start here. We're going to uh, start with interference detection. We're worried about how parts fit together or are working on a massive assembly and need to see if they occupy the same space. We can use interference detection. How do we use interference detection? Simply select the assembly or parts we want to check. Then we can choose if there are components to exclude and how we want to handle coincidence or sub-assemblies. We can just go ahead and select calculate. SOLIDWORKS will take over showing how many interferences we have and what their specific volume is. We'll even get a visual representation of the interfering region on the parts. If we expand the interferences, we can see what specific parts are interfering. We know the problem is isolated to our base assembly, so let's open that up. We're going to uh, investigate a little further. There's a dimension on the tab back here that we can adjust to remove the interference. And then we can, uh, you know, change it real quick. We can do a rebuild. And then we will eventually rerun our interference evaluation to see if we've resolved the problem. So, what does interference detection actually do to our model? It's nothing, but it does show us the interferences. So as you know, mechanical designers and engineers, we can evaluate whether those interferences matter. And it can provide that information in an easy you know, visual representation. So moving on to uh, clearance verification. Why should we care about clearance verification? Some of you may uh, design electronics components that need uh, appropriate spacing between each other. Or maybe you just need to make sure there's uh, sufficient space uh, so maybe lubrication or something can fit in between components. Now, our uh, double E, our electrical engineer, tells us we need to pay attention to the clearances around our batteries and the holder. So simply, uh, we're hiding parts here, as you can see. When selecting clearance verification, we can select the parts that we want to, uh, you know, check for a clearance for. So grab those three. So then we can select our minimum acceptable clearance of, uh, you know, quarter of a millimeter. SOLIDWORKS tells us, upon hitting calculate, that we have two parts that are at a zero millimeter clearance. The results box shows us that both batteries are touching the outside walls.
We can always check our options to see if we missed an option. But it looks like everything was right for this uh, particular view. We're not really worried about whether the batteries touch the sides of the holder, to be honest. But we do care about the spacing of the batteries themselves. When we check the clearance between these two parts, we see no clearance. Really what this means is there's no clearance problems. The parts in this case are further than our minimum requirement. So if that minimum, as you can see, was half a millimeter, you see uh, the warning, the parts are inside that minimum clearance. And as a pro tip, if you change the clearance minimum value to uh, zero millimeters, the output will just be whatever clearances between those parts that you select, regardless of what that value is. It's a quick little way to take that measurement. So, big question, what does clearance ver verification actually do to our model? Well, nothing. But we can check for the clearance between specific components, and we can identify specific clearances that don't meet the specified requirement. So, well, why do we uh, care about hole alignment? One's pretty obvious, you know, uh, can your assembly even be put together? You know, how often have we 2 a.m. on Christmas Eve tried to, uh, you know, put a washer and a nut together and it won't even work? I mean, that's never happened to me before. How would we solve this problem by using hole alignment tool? We'll start by choosing a value the deviation range. The default is 10 millimeters, which is a, uh, a good starting point. You can see we have several deviations listed. If we use a tighter hole center deviation, the hole alignment analysis finds no errors. If we use a hole center deviation that is too large, SOLIDWORKS won't correctly find the holes that we're looking for. Value you may have to uh, refine and hone for your particular applications, but usually just the default 10 millimeters looks well. We look at a front view here. You can see the deviations in the holes. So clearly this would not work for what we're trying to do. We have a few problems fitting some uh, bolts through there. So what does hole alignment actually do to our model? Well, uh, nothing, but we can check for misaligned holes and an unnamed bike manufacturer won't have to lose a customer for life. <laughs> so why do we care about the measure tool? Maybe we need to know the specific size of a part to ensure we're working on the right version verification or what uh, checking a measurement that has a result of multiple features measure tool is awesome it's one of my favorites it's essentially like having a tape measure to interrogate dimensions of your model maybe we want to look at the distance between uh, some of these holes for example We can also dictate what type of cylindrical dimensions we want to measure. This is killer. We can do, uh, you know, just regular center to center. We could do the minimum or maximum distance, or you can even get weird with it and do a custom difference. Uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, minimum of one and maximum of another. And uh, since I don't know, you know, the superior metric system, I can switch over to freedom units for my tiny little bring. So the measurement number is actually something that I understand. We can measure across the parts or hide parts to select other geometry if we want to as well. So what does the measure tool actually do to our model? Well, 
all nothing. We can measure distances, angles, radiuses, sketches, parts, assemblies, and drawings. And we can do so between all types of geometric elements, and they don't have to be the same. You don't have to do a hole to a hole. Do a hole to a flat surface if you want. The world is yours. So, moving on to mass properties. Why should we care about mass properties? Uh, well, pre-printing shipping labels require a known weight. Um, you use mass properties, you know, for rough cost estimates. It'd be pretty embarrassing if uh, you go through the final stages of manufacturing for a part only to find that it won't fit on our existing tanks. So for our assembly, let's take a look at the mass of this little flashlight. In doing so, we can see, if we take a look at the mass, that's about uh, 450 kilograms, which I think is maybe a little heavy for a flashlight. And again, my tiny brain doesn't understand metric, so I'm just going to switch to, uh, you know, our freedom units. We see that we have nearly a 1,000 pound flashlight here. It's a tad high. Pretty close to the deadlift world record. But uh, in looking at my assembly, I see that the center of mass is super duper high. Right there. So let's take a look at this switch part here. When I open it up, you can see there's no material applied. This is something I've seen a ton of companies do that I think is a pretty smart but a little sneaky trick. They've set their document templates to a high density default. so They can be sure to change their material to something uh, more appropriate. So we need to do our due diligence here, set the material to plastic. Our material library. Then we could uh, rerun to see what our overall mass is. That's a lot better. So what does mass properties actually do to our model? Well, nothing. But we can find the mass, density, or volume of one or more components or bodies at the assembly level. So why should we care about section properties? Maybe I don't want to do a full-blown simulation analysis, but I do need a quick hand calculation of something. But where? Am I going to find the moment inertia data for specified phases? Section properties, I can select one or more phases. By selecting recalculate. I'm not only given the surface area, but also the corresponding moments of inertia. What I think it's really cool is you can also use this tool with phases that are a result of, uh, let's say you do a section cut. The section view. Hit recalculate. So, in short, what the section properties actually do to our model? Well, nothing. But if we need moments of inertia for sections, section properties can uh, give us that. Moving on to sensors. Why should we care about sensors? Uh, you know, we have a lot on our plate. It's impossible to remember every single detail that uh, on our checklist that we need to do off the top of our heads. Maybe we need to know some important design characteristics that other team members uh, pick up the project, and they need to be aware of it. Plus, you know, as time between touching a project, you know, passes, more likely we are to forget of uh, critical details. So, for sensors, we can add simulation data, mass properties, dimensions, interference detection, uh, measurements, proximity, and costing data. 
simply select a uh, reference dimension here. And I can set an alert that will warn me if my dimension goes below a specified value. We can add sensors just by right clicking on the folder. And if I want to set my notification trigger warning those, I just click that as well. Now I get a call from the field and I hear that these tabs are deflecting. So maybe if we beef them up a bit, we'll take care of the problem. So crisis averted. When I go back to my assembly, that warning. At least I was warned about this. So I know I need to improve my stiffness. That's going to cause the clearance issue at manufacturing. We should back off the dimension a little bit by opening up the part, changing that dimension. When I go back to the top level, I can recheck the sensor, rebuild, and very good. Everything's all. What do the sensors actually do to our model? Nothing. But we can set ourselves up to remember important details by monitoring specific properties. You can do this for a variety of design data as well, all kinds of things. I just showed you a dimension. So moving on to assembly visualization. Why should we care about assembly visualization? Well, maybe our team is uh, more visual oriented. The chart isn't going to help them understand, uh, you know, the model representation. Maybe management has tasked us with reducing our design's weight by, say, 100 pounds. When I launch the assembly visualization, the default display is an alphabetically sorted list of our parts with their quantities and mass. We can sort by any of these header columns like mass. There's even a roll bar to hide all the small components I don't want to show the team. They're negligible. Mass isn't the only property we can look at. We can bring in other physical properties, file properties, or even performance properties like, uh, you know, graphics triangles. This review, I want to get the best bang for my buck. So I need to be sure and multiply the quantity by weight, which is easy to do just with an equation that you saw there. Whenever I get my final assembly looking the way I want to, to help the under team on where we should focus, I can save it out as in a display state. Now, anytime I want to show somebody this representation, I just have to activate the display state. Just as easy as switching configurations. Just like that. So what does assembly visualization actually do to our model? Nothing. We can uh, you know, create a visual representation of our assemblies with specific properties or calculations. Moving along to performance evaluation. Why should we care about performance evaluation? Is there anybody who just has way too many time on their hands here? Well, for everybody else, uh, rebuild time often feels like wasted time. What about those times when we know we could just from better performance, less frustration? We don't really know where to start and how to improve performance. 
how we can tackle that uh, challenge is with performance evaluation. You can get a simple one-click report that tells us all the things, all kinds of data, parts list that might be taking too long to rebuild. Maybe we should take a look at. There's even a list of parts that could be causing issues with high graphics resources. If you have assemblies with a lot of parts, good one to take a look at. Probably a good chance you have some parts that have way too many uh, graphics triangles. We also get a kind of statistic, a statistic list of the assembly with how many parts, unique files, and the assembly depth. How many sub-assemblies, how many levels it goes down. There's even a cool one-click button to leverage the last tool we use, a little throwback, assembly visualization, to show us all kinds of potential performance problems like graphics triangles. In our case, the worst performing part is uh, this little rock grate, which is inside the grill, which we can't even see. We'll have to take a look at that. So what does performance evaluation actually do to our model? Nothing. But it does take a look at the performance of an assembly and help us with improvement suggestions. It's also super helpful the larger and more complex our assembly is really good thing to check in on every now and then. So uh, I lied to you folks a little bit. Um, I said we're gonna be looking at the evaluate toolbar, but this one, collision detection, should be in the evaluate toolbar. It's actually not, it's in the assembly toolbar kind of hidden. So why should we care about collision detection? Why would we make this assembly in the first place? we're good enough to uh, just look at the parts in the assembly and tell how components will behave. Or, uh, you know, maybe we don't want to rebuild tons of prototypes and uh, waste everybody's time finding out things don't fit together or won't behave as we expect. How, would you, how do we use this tool? It's actually hidden in the move components. You just have to enable collision detection and stop at collision while using move component. Now that we have all our boxes checked, we're going to take a look at this U-joint range of motion. You can see in these blue faces, they prevent the handle from moving you know, all the way around, 360 degrees like we expected. So we're going to fix that by taking the edge off these yokes with a little chamfer. And we can verify our design, confirm, that we have our intended range of motion running with collision detection. So what does collision detection actually do to our model? Well, nothing, but we can use it to check where parts collide and we can identify the range of motion of the parts and make changes to the parts. So why should we care about curvature? Ever design a part you're certain was going to uh, look great, only to notice its defects once it's been made? Or how about getting tasked with uh, a design more modern, with smoother blends and transitions? For this grill, the top and bottom covers are what everybody's going to see on the showroom floor. So I want to the curvature, make sure it's consistent and smooth, rather than going through each individual fillet. I can use curvature to see a color representation of the curves. The design is okay, but I really like a version that leverages curvature continuity by changing the configuration. And we can see that there is a gradient of color indicating blending curvature. So how do we get that awesome curvature continuity? For the part, we can uh, take a look at the curvature, set it to the continuous option for the profile, their fillet parameters. So what does the curvature tool and evaluate toolbar 
actually do to our model? Well, nothing. It can help us visually see the curvature of our parts within the assembly. So moving on to symmetry check. Why should we care about symmetry check? We get complicated parts from suppliers. We want to simplify. Or we need to make sure to design asymmetric parts for, you know, a single direction assembly. I need to make sure that this part can only be assembled one way. So I'm going to uh, check the symmetry about and to make sure that I have asymmetric parts, which uh, I can see that I do. We can see which parts are asymmetric, which are symmetric, and even save out a report. If I thought I was supposed to have a symmetric part, I can also use this tool at the part level as well. At the part level, symmetry check will show uh, my faces that are symmetric and asymmetric or unique. So what does symmetry check actually do to our model? Nothing. We can check for symmetry and parts about a plane and uh, identify unique faces. Maybe we want them, maybe we don't. So moving on to compare documents, very useful tool. Um, Sure, none of you have ever had customers that send a part with revisions that are only text changes with the same geometry, but in fact, they turn out completely different. But what about two parts in inventory that seem almost identical and you just want to be sure that these are the same part? How I solve that challenge is with compare documents. I choose what my reference document is and what my modified document is do this for parts, assemblies, and drawings, I can compare, uh, you know, properties as well, document properties that you've entered in. When I look at comparison, SOLIDWORKS will tell me that I can't do a face comparison because this is an assembly, but I'll still get some really uh, good details out for the assembly level. And I can look at uh, these really cool representations where the geometry is different with uh, all these color filters applied to them. See all the materials that are different, be added, or some common materials. So what does compare documents actually do to our model? Nothing. Well, we can compare documents properties, features, geometry, bill of materials, or two configurations of the same document or just two different documents. So why should we care about Simulation Express? Maybe we want a peace of mind for uh, our first pass stress analysis. Or if we have a design idea, but not sure if it's going uh, down the path is worthwhile. Maybe we want to vet out some of the lower level design ideas before we submit further analysis to our simulation experts. Most of us are rarely asked to, uh, you know, increase our prototyping costs, so we can definitely help out with that. Even though SimExpress shows up in the Evaluate tab, though, on assemblies, you can only use it for parts, but I'd like to show you how it works anyway. SimExpress is a step-by-step -step wizard that walks you through a basic linear part simulation, linear static FEA. You can uh, select which faces you want to be fixed. The property manager boxes look and feel like a traditional SOLIDWORKS dialog. So it's pretty intuitive. Just keep hitting next from the task pane and I'm ready to add my force. I'm getting a visual representation of where the force is at. 
and uh, I can enter in on the side the magnitude. Then SOLIDWORKS pulls uh, any material that's been assigned to the part, or I can change it here if I want to. And once we run our analysis, we're presented with uh, my favorite feature, quick little animation that shows an over-exaggerated uh, representation of what's actually going on internally. Just to uh, kind of gut check and see if what I did was correct. With the results, we can see uh, the von Mises stress uh, sorry, von Mises stresses displacement or show where our factor of safety is below a certain number that we define. In this case, it's going to be, uh, see those red areas, it's below a factor of safety of one, which is definitely bad. When we're done, we have the option of exporting this information to an eDrawings file. Next option we have is to optimize the model itself. This is my favorite part of the SOLIDWORKS Sim Express tool. Uh, it will directly access our design data, how this part was made. And we can specify a feature or dimension to edit as a part of a design study. So we're just setting up a range for values that this could be to improve our factor of safety value. Once this design study is completed, we have the choice of keeping the original value design or use the optimal result that we just found in our design study. Since it's right within our modeling environment, we can even change that value to a not crazy value, something nice and round. Since we're working with the same interface, it's not a problem to go right back to our original simulation study and rerun the analysis to find our new results. So right from within the same interface, we're able to ensure that our new rounded value of 20 is as expected going to be uh, within our design guidelines. So what does Sim Express actually do to our model? Nothing. We can run a first pass stress analysis. We can test in a virtual environment to reduce our number of required field tests. We do have to remember that our analysis is only as good as our setup. Remember, uh, garbage in equals garbage out. We can only calculate displacements, strains, and stresses for linear materials and part files only. Keep that in mind for Sim Express. So, moving right along to Sim Express's cousin, Flow Express. So, why should we care about Flow Express? Well, guys may have application requirements that uh, we have to meet. Or maybe we uh, know our product's great, but we need to help create a visual representation that others can understand. Just like Sim Express Wizard, the Flow Express is a step-by-step -step guide to help us do a quick flow analysis. First step I didn't know, or I didn't show you, was capping the ends, so we already did that. We need an enclosed volume to work from, but when I select next, you'll see that closed volume. I can uh, select the fluid. It can either be water or air. I can set my mass flow rate at the inlet here. And then at my outlet phase. And then Flow Express solves giving me uh, these really cool graphics. There's even cool animations. Look at that.
You can also use the uh, these little balls, which can be an easier representation to, to see, and we can grab images, and if we want, generate a report. I think these are the most fun. So what does Flow Express actually do to our model? Well, nothing. We can calculate fluid velocity through a single cavity for a single fluid. Just like all simulations, it's only as good as our setup, garbage in, garbage out. We can get all kinds of awesome visual content, including animation. Move right along, why should we care about DriveWorks Express? I mean, we all love our salespeople, keep us in business with new jobs to do. I think we can all relate to a salesperson who brings up a job that's exactly like the one we just did, but only five things are different. If we have an intern that we uh, don't want to make, uh, you know, a crazy dumb mistake, doesn't know if we should choose a 10 foot part A or a 10 foot part B. How do we tackle these challenges with DriveWorks Express? Once we've created our database file, we can get to work. We select what part we want to use from this uh, particular assembly. The parts. Along with what dimensions we want to add to this project. We'll even give them names more clear what we're adjusting. Also choose to include uh, specific features as well. We can pull in custom properties to use as a variable in our project. can even select specific drawings as templates for future design iterations. This can save a lot of time downstream. Then we can begin building our form, which allows us to customize the interface that, you know, the end user uh, of our company going to see that aren't as familiar with design intent. You can uh, simply choose the input names that make sense and are easy to follow that anybody can understand. Then I choose what the constraints of those inputs need to be. It's like a text field or a drop down list to limit what users are able to choose or for specific uh, inputs. Then I can test the input, and make sure it looks the way I want. If I'm satisfied, I can start mapping the variables from the input form to my design. This is the beauty of DriveWorks. I can build in the logic for how I want the project to use the form input data for things like file names, dimension, calculations, or overall design intent. Once I've built all the logic, the power of DriveWorks comes to life. I simply fill out the form, and DriveWorks automates the process that was defined in the beginning, creates new files or adds existing ones, giving me the finished product data quickly and efficiently. Now when sales says, I just need a drawing of this model, only slightly different, it's a quick workflow to accomplish this task with minimal effort. So what does DriveWorks actually do to our model? Well, nothing. We can create sort of a master model that can create other files. Move right along to costing. Why should I care about costing? 
We have a manual costing process or a thumb in the air style process. Uh, maybe some of our veterans who know all this stuff are retiring and us younger folks don't have a good feel for our costs. They were just looking to use some different machines for a shirt on the short term and aren't sure of, you know, the rough cost change. Assembly costing is part of SOLIDWORKS Premium, but part costing can be done at any level of SOLIDWORKS. Assembly costing shows us what we have yet to be costed in the assembly and what parts already have cost information, part level. For specific parts, we can determine if we want to use purchase part costs or if we're using toolbox components, and we want to pull their costs from the toolbox library. Then we can begin our cost estimate. Assembly costing goes through and calculates the costs for components that haven't been calculated yet uh, based on our rules and adds all the various costs together to get the big picture cost. Assembly costing groups the parts together based on how the costs were calculated. You can see here. Just like any simulation, is essentially what costing is. Costing is only as accurate as the setup. We have a template editor to add costing data for various machining operations, as well as assembly costs, inspection costs, so on and so forth. As with our other simulations, costing doesn't really do us much good if we can't share our insights with others, so we have the ability to build a report template and use that to publish our information. For our assembly here, we've added the report to the design binder, which is a great way to store additional data within our SOLIDWORKS file. And we can see our costing reports that we can share internally or you know, even with our customers as needed. So what does costing actually do to our model? Can automate the costing process for sheet metal, machined, multi-body parts, assemblies, plastic molded, cast, uh, 3D printed parts, and multi-body weldments. Most importantly, these costs are just a guide. They're only as accurate as our setup. Why should we care about sustainability? Maybe our company has some green initiatives or core values for reducing carbon footprint. Footprint. Maybe our own personal conscience worried about the future. How do we solve this challenge is with uh, sustainability. We can select a class of material, so whether it's plastic, steel, aluminum, or carbon fiber, for example. We can choose the locations and see the overall impact of our part. Best part of this tool is the use of it for changes. We select a different material, we can see how the change an environmental impact. We can also change locations and see the overall impact, which helps us understand the transportation aspects of uh, the environmental impact. By default, the changes we make to the sustainability shows us a percentage change relative to the last study uh, ran. Within the sustainability tool, we can set a baseline so that any change we make is compared against that baseline. We can even use the tool to export other materials. Maybe there's a material that we didn't consider for manufacture, but we know physically it would work for the application. So what does that materials environmental impact look like? Or maybe there's a different process that can be used. We can get a different impact to the environment, but get a part that performs just as well for our particular application. So what does sustainability actually do to our model? 
can use it to understand how different decisions impact our carbon footprint. Whenever we're creating assemblies, let's always remember uh, Simon's circle. We start by focusing on the why we're creating these assemblies in the first place, because the evaluation tools are how we answer these questions. But even though what these tools do to our model is nothing, the insights, you know, they're everything to us.